So Stephanie, you want to come on up and um, uh, introduce um, our, our friends and, and uh, possibly uh, tell us all about what to do this summer for pool safety? Great, because this is actually a really important message, and we really appreciate you inviting us here tonight. And the reason that I brought these two handsome gentlemen with me is because these are the paramedics that respond to a lot of these calls. So before I get into that, on June 8th, we're having our third annual, what we call Children Drown Without a Sound Water Safety Expo. It's hugely popular. Uh, we have vendors there that show you everything you need to protect your backyard, your pool. Uh, we have CPR classes you can sign up for. Uh, we have the Swim Academy, very well-respected Swim Academy here in the Valley that you can sign up for swim lessons. Adults or children, it could be your grandchildren. Uh, so there's a lot of really great value. We actually, just for fun and giggles, bring the USAR team and the Hazardous Materials team. Uh, Castaic lifeguards will be there. Just we have a we have a 911 drill where we play a real 911 call from a mom who found her daughter at the bottom of the pool, and that ended happy, but it was an extremely dramatic response, and uh, and her daughter survived. Uh, so it's a great event, um, and I guess the message is, and I'm going to let these guys tell you more of the message because they see it. I I don't see it. I just see the end result. Is, is the theme that we've cho chosen. Children drown without a sound. Think about it. Mo a lot of kids are trying to get into the pool without being heard. So they're not out there screaming, Mom, I'm going to go in the backyard. I, I don't care that you said I couldn't swim. And they're trying to climb over the gate or get to the pool or get something they, that fell in the pool. And then they go under silently. So hence the children drown without a sound. There's no way for them to cry. There's no way for them to kick. There's no way for anyone to know that, um, that they're in trouble. So one of the first things we tell people with young kids, or if you're a grandparent watching your kids or watching family kids, if, you're, if that child is missing in your house, the first place you go is out to the pool. Don't look anywhere else. Don't go out the front door. Don't look under the beds thinking they're playing. You run out to the pool. You alleviate that, any possibility that they're in the pool area. And then you have to have all the mechanisms. You have to have the lock. You have to have the... Uh, the alarm on your door that leads out to the pool, pool covers. There's all kinds of things you can do to take every precaution. And even then, there's no guarantee. This mom that I spoke about a few years ago, who's, her daughter was then two or three, I can't remember. She had every single um, mechanism for pool safety, a gate, the alarm on her door. It just so happened that the, the double latch on her gate leading to the pool had broken, probably the day before, because she said that previous day it was working and her daughter went out to the pool and was at the bottom she was not breathing she luckily this mom knew CPR um, so my message is even if you don't have kids even if you don't have grandkids start watching when you're in um, at lakes or pools and watch parents with little kids it's so fascinating they think that because there's adults around um, it's impossible for uh, the kids to drown and guess what these paramedics will tell you that it happens all the time. So take some responsibility like I have. I learned by doing these uh, pool safety expos. And look, watch, just people that you don't know, watch if they're watching their children, and you'll be absolutely fascinated. So I probably gave away all your good, all your good info, huh? <laughs> but Brian, Cl uh, Brian Clayton and Brian Hinesley, uh, firefighter paramedics from Fire Station 107 here on Soledad in Canyon Country. And these are our A-team a paramedics. They respond to a lot of drownings. And so I'm just going to ask you to ask questions and think about things that you'd like to know. And I'd just add something. I'm sorry if I... I took it all the way. I'm passionate about this subject because every year in Santa Clarita we see so much. It's so hot here and so many people have pools. And I'll, I know you're going to come up with something. Thank you, Stephanie. She did pretty much give you all the real important uh, points about this safety. And I think the biggest thing that we can't be serious enough about is that watch kids. Because kids are kids. They're going to be kids. They're going to go out and and do their own thing. They don't know what kind of trouble they can get into until they've already gotten into it. And a lot of times, uh, like Stephanie said, there will be adults around, parents around, and all it takes is a run to the bathroom or a phone call, and it happens that quick. And we all talk about kids, but adults drown also. Okay? So 
something also to think about anytime we're outdoor at a pool. If it's a party, if it's a get together, whatever it may be. Take that time, just keep an eye on everybody in the pool, what's going on, especially if there's alcohol involved or anything like that. And we all know anytime you involve alcohol or things like that, people tend to get a little bit loose. Um, Brian and I have been on a couple of drownings just in the last year and a half that involved adults uh, in a situation where there was upwards to 15 to 20 people in a public pool area and the person still wound up at the bottom of the pool somehow. Uh, lucky for them, there's usually within 15 or 20 people somebody knows what to do or at least has an idea of what to do. First thing, get them out of the water. Um, no CPR, that's huge. And CPR has been made so much easier nowadays for all of us. The whole mouth to mouth and things like that is kind of out of the window. If any of you are familiar with or have taken the classes, you have the compression only CPR. We have a young lady here from Red Cross who are, they were great about having training and classes with this. Anybody can do it. Um, but just be aware. Be aware of your surroundings. Be really, really keep a good eye on those kids. And, um, you know, all these safety precautions in the world, accidents are still going to happen. So know what to do. Get them out of the water. Call 911 and no CPR. Okay? Any questions now? Yes, sir. The lady said she's passionate about it. She said, fortunately, the person, the mother, knew CPR. You're saying someone may be around that knows CPR. Why doesn't the fire department, uh, the other departments that are of some size, press the educational people? No kid graduates from high school without knowing CPR, and perhaps he should learn it in his freshman year. There have been children younger than freshman high school that have saved someone because they knew it. I don't understand why we ha don't have the situation now that everybody out on the road, everybody in the mall and in the grocery store knows CPR. And it could be heart attack, it could be any other thing, and it's such an easy thing, and they wouldn't put a lot of time in school to learn that. We need to press that, maybe even to our legislators, maybe there has to be a law. But that's what I think should happen. Oh, my wife reminds me, Washington State does make them learn that. So, Well, what I know of that so far is this. We have actually had a program um, with the Red Cross where we went out and did a community day. Actually, was it a, uh, several? American Heart, I'm sorry. The American Heart Association, where we actually had mannequins, and we set up essentially at grocery stores. We were over here at the Costco just last year teaching CPR to anybody who was interested. We, we were there for most of the day as the shoppers came in and were willing or interested. We would show them compression-only CPR and how it's performed. We had a, ma a mannequin set up and everything. And this was done throughout all of Santa Clarita. I believe the county fire department did it throughout all of their cities. Also, interesting, my son, who goes to Rosedale Elementary School in Saugus, he knows CPR. Not for me, from the school. Okay. Now, I, I didn't ask him if there was a particular program, if everybody learned, but he it told me that in his class, his teacher brought out the uh, American Heart Association's Compression Only CPR, gave them the basics on what they could do as children, even, you know, eight-year-olds, you know, and eight, I believe eight to ten or eleven-year-olds, because my, my daughter was also in, had the same thing, and gave them just this is the idea behind it, and this is the rhythm behind the compressions. So it's out there. Now, I, I don't know if it's a, a curriculum through all the schools, but I think that is a great idea, especially at the, to be re revisited at the high school level. Yeah. Yeah. Your timing is absolutely phenomenal because L.A. County Fire Department just received a grant for $250,000 to purchase what they call CPR anytime, chest compressions only, as Brian was saying. We are now bringing that program into our public schools and private and charter schools. There's no discriminating. And we're teaching that what, what's been identified as the ideal age is ninth graders. So here in, we just finished Valencia High School where we trained 300 ninth graders, probably different ages in there too, eighth and, t no, not eighth, but ninth and tenth probably. 
and there's various schools throughout our division, which is more than Santa Clarita, that we are teaching. That's becoming bigger and bigger, and your comment about Washington is absolutely right. Seattle has had this program for 40 years, and a, a huge number of their residents are trained, and their statistics uh, have high success rates for just chest compressions, hands-only CPR. And unfortunately, LA County has dismal um, uh, success rates. But we're, we are trying to change that. The fire chief gave us $50,000. The LA County Quality and Productivity Commission gave us $200,000. And so we're just beginning this program. We're now working on grant funding for up to a million dollars to continue the program for the following school year. So you're going to be hearing more and more about it. And I'm so glad that you brought that up. We had a question in the front, ma'am. Okay. Let me just ask. I'm sorry. Let me just ask a, a couple quick questions. First of all, when I was babysitting at the age of 14 in Florida, I was home one day and I heard that the four-year-old that I babysat had drowned in the family pool. The mother took a phone call. She walked away for a few minutes. She came back. Baby was at the bottom. Uh, so yes, it does happen. Stephanie mentioned fences and uh, pool covers. Um, obviously, you can't depend on any of this stuff, really. The parent has to keep an eye on it. But are there recommendations that you have for people about the type of fencing and about pool covers? Because a child could fall in on top of a pool cover, roll over, and go underneath and not no one see them. Right. There are many types of pool covers. Uh, obviously, the best are probably the most expensive. Uh, and those are the hard covers you can go out and walk on. Um, the fencing is the most important, uh, to fence off your pool. And I, I'm not familiar 100% with the current laws when you have a pool built nowadays, whether you... On June 8th, there'll be somebody to talk about how that works out. I, I remember growing up with a pool in my backyard and no fence. We were thrown in the pool, learned how to swim like everybody else, and once we got it, we, off we went. Um, but those fences now, I think, are almost mandatory. Most people who have pools now have that fence, and it's a self-closing fence. I'll, I'll use, for example, the apartment complexes and condominium complexes. They must have them, and they must be self-latching, meaning that when they walk in the door, the door shuts and latches and closes. Um, part of our responsibility to do our inspections throughout all of these apartments and townhome complexes, a fire department every year, is to check those gates. And occasionally we do get phone calls from residents saying, the gates are locked, are, are, are blocked open and things like that. And we take that very, very seriously, obviously, because we've, we've been there on the calls and we've seen what can happen. Um, but those, those are the things that if they're self-latching and closing, by the time they're tall enough to unlatch it or put the key in it, well, hopefully they know how to swim and, and, and everything. You know, we're worried about these little ones that don't know any better and they're going to reach and fall in the pool, and no one's going to be around. And like Stephanie said, they, they do. When they go under, there's no screaming or anything like that. You don't even know it. So sometimes, you know, when we say our, when our kids get silent, that's when we get worried. That's absolutely the truth there. Okay. Should every single pool have one of those long hooks hanging conspicuously somewhere where everybody can see it? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think anybody who has a pool, or, or especially any public pool, should have a, uh, I forget what they call it, a gaff hook and a life preserver. Um, it, it's just, it's there as an aid. Not everybody who watches children swim knows how to swim themselves. Um, and boy, that's a disaster ready, you know, all ready to happen there. But it happens, you know, the people take their kids out and they're not comfortable swimming. So there should be an implement or a means to retrieve them. But now a lot of times those implements are there and no one realizes they're there or nobody sees them. So that's where that CPR training comes in. It, it puts people in that mindset that something could go wrong. And that if it does, at least that they've prepared their mind at least once or twice, what would I do if this occurred or if this happened. And we all know if we're prepared for it, at least in our minds, at least once or twice, if something does occur, at least we can you know, go out and, and make a difference with that. When you sell a house these days without a fence because the kids have gotten older and there aren't any little ones anymore, the seller doesn't have to have the fence. It's on the buyer. 
to put it up, which I was very interested about that. Wow. So I'm going to take some of those and give it to my daughter's mother-in-law and say, leave this on the counter for these people because they're squirrely about it. Absolutely. The other thing is, is when do these? Uh, when are you going to West Ranch? Do you know? I believe it's the 22nd, 23rd. And who do you deal with at the schools? Uh, I, the principals. No, oh, Bob Vincent then. Okay. Uh, so at West Ranch, I met with the assistant principal. Got it. Okay. Very good. Well, I'm going to get my 10th grader in there somehow. <laughs> It may be all the ASB kids for the heck of it. Okay. Hi. Um, I just want to comment. I actually had a neighbor that had one of those party tubs that people put ice in for beers and sodas or also sometimes wash their dogs in. And after a party, there was a lot of, I guess, melted ice or whatever. Anyway, a little two-year-old went in head first, and nobody hurt her. Had the family dog not started barking like crazy, and they went to go see what the dog was barking about. She wasn't breathing, but fortunately somebody did know CPR and was able to revive her. So not just pools. Anything that will hold water more than a couple of inches deep, you have to be careful of it. I inherited a house that did not have a fence, and uh, a year later I had my son. And one of the first things we did was put in a fence, and we contracted a um, general contractor who did wrought iron, and he said the minimum height was five feet, and we said, no, we want six. <laughs> we want six. And the latch is all the way at the top, so even I have a hard time unlocking that gate to get into the pool. You're right, because kids get smart when they're three and four years old, and they learn how to climb on top of things. And Absolutely. Know, know your children and know what they're capable of and know how to keep them safe. Good job. That's great. Any other, any questions, other questions for the firefighters in general? It doesn't have to be water safety. Do you want any other questions? Love you. <laughs> More of a comment, but thank you. We'll take that. Yeah, uh, Stephanie, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I know now that... that um, we're talking about compression only CPR. Yes. Uh, it, what is the difference in effectiveness between the uh, o the older style CPR that was uh, both breath and compression and compression only? Uh, well, it's more the uh, physiology now, um, and the idea of it is with com where we would do compressions, and the rates used to change every year. It was a fifteen to one, fifteen to two, thirty to one, thirty to two. Every year. They seem to try to figure out a, a better way to do CPR. And what they found, the common denominator was that every time you stopped compressing, you would reduce what they call an inner thoracic pressure. In the inner thoracic pressure, you're only going to be able to, when you compress someone's chest and you kind of sandwich the heart between your uh, sternum and then the backbone, when you're compressing it, the effectiveness of those compressions is, I think, maybe 30% of a regular compression of the heart. 30%, that's it. Not very much. But it does give a small percentage chance of perfusing enough blood to get enough oxygen to the, our main organ up here to keep us alive for a certain amount of time, to buy us a little bit of time, maybe perhaps until 911 responds or, or something occurs in, in, of that nature. Now that's all we're doing is buying time with CPR. Now, when you stop that compression, you lose that pressure. You build up that pressure with the compressions. The first two or three or four, it, it's kind of like pumping up a, a, an inflatable raft. The first couple of pumps, it doesn't go anywhere. But after a while, you kind of see that you've got some pressure going and it's working pretty good. So now if you do that compression only, you don't have to worry about, well, a lot of people worried about placing their lips on another person's lips. And although there were pocket masks and face shields and things like that, cumbersome, not really sure how to use it. I'm not really sure if I want to breathe into someone's mouth. That shied a lot of people away from doing CPR, jumping in, that might have otherwise went ahead and done that. But if the people know that all they need to do is go in there and do those compressions on the chest, you know, at a rate of about 100 times a minute. If they just go, if they sing the Staying Alive song in their minds. That's how they teach us, how they taught it to the kids. If they sing that song in their minds and they keep compressing that chest up and down and they do it as long as they possibly can until they are so tired that maybe someone else can come in and continue, that pressure will stay up, hopefully inside that chest cavity, and give them just enough time 
for when we get there. Hopefully we can start IV lines, we can sh defibrillate, do whatever all the stuff that they've taught us how to do to help maybe preserve this person's life. So it, it's basically just buying time and that's the easiest, most consistent way to kind of keep that level going. And we've even changed our standards with our CPR when we show up. We try to keep those compressions going as long as possible. And that whole airway thing, secondary, because our body retains a lot of oxygen. It retains enough oxygen in our lungs to keep, get that you know, circulation going. Hope that answered your question, maybe more so than you asked for. <laughs> Yes, they're going to all the schools, but I brought these for you tonight, and I'm going to ask you to partner with me. Take the, let these be gone tonight by the time you all leave, and take them wherever it makes sense. So I'll, I'll leave them here or in the back or wherever. But before I leave, can I just tell you that um, what you already know, this, these guys are just amazing. You, you are blessed. We are blessed. I live in Santa Clarita to have L.A. County Fire Department represent us and be servicing uh, us in the community. This is our busiest squad in Santa Clarita, these paramedics. They are really truly the A-team and um, I just want to, you know, l allow you to show their appreciate your appreciation for them. We appreciate what you guys do. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you.